I'm Jason, 29 years old. I work for a newspaper company. Lately, I've become more confident in my job and have started to feel more decisive when mentoring my juniors. I got married last year. Emily, who worked at a coffee chain tenant in our company building. She became quite popular. Many customers came just to see her, as she was considered one of the pretty staff members. I was over the moon when she secretly gave me her contact information inside the store. It was unbelievable. We had casual chats during her shifts, but I never expected Emily to be interested in me. Everything progressed smoothly from there. Of course, due to work, frequent dates weren't possible, but we kept in close contact, and I made sure to visit the shop whenever Emily was working. On our days off, I spent as much time as possible with her. After dating for a year, I proposed, and we did our best to fulfill Emily's wishes for the wedding. A garden wedding amidst a profusion of blooming roses. A wedding dress with a rose motif. Emily, holding a bouquet of white and yellow roses, looked truly beautiful. Even after marriage, work keeps me busy. It's regrettable that I don't get as much time with Emily as I had hoped, but when I return to our new condo, she always has dinner ready. She sits across from me at the dinner table, sipping coffee with a smile, and shares stories about her day. It feels like a waste that she quit her job to focus on supporting me, but when she cutely says, I don't want us to live like ships passing in the night, I can help but feel it's not so bad. The only shadow in my otherwise smooth sailing life is my boss, Michael. Michael has been my supervisor since he transferred to our department five years ago, and our relationship wasn't bad at first. We had a decent trust as boss and subordinate. But at some point, he started kicking garbage cans and chairs near my desk as if by accident and responded to my greetings with a jerk of his chin and no words. Sometimes, he even fails to notify me about important matters. Michael, what's going on lately? Did you do something? Or maybe you were a fan of Emily? My colleague Chris jokes in an attempt to lighten the mood. So far, it hasn't impacted my work significantly. Emily says she doesn't even remember Michael. Maybe it's jealousy over a subordinate having a beautiful wife. I thought it would pass and decided to leave it be for a while. Two years into our marriage, I was investigating a backdoor admission scandal at a university. The president was allegedly accepting money for admission favors. I almost had solid evidence and cooperation from an insider just a step away from completing the article. Then, one day, I was called into the president's office. There were President Thompson, Michael, and Luke, my informant. Luke, why are you here? I'm here because you said you wouldn't disclose my identity. The president called me in today. You were the only one I was in contact with. What about my future now? It's all messed up. Luke yelled angrily. I hadn't shared his personal information with anyone in the company. Despite my strict information management, how did this leak? Jason, given the situation, we must assume the president is aware of our investigation. They will have prepared counter arguments for any evidence we present. We'll continue the investigation, but you need to step back for now. We'll contact you later. Stay at home in the meantime. We will also compensate Luke. Stunned by President Thompson's words, I realized that there was nothing I could do at the moment. As I was leaving the president's office, I raised my head to see Michael's face, unsuccessfully trying to hide his delight behind a solemn expression, with a slight smile tugging at the corner of his mouth. In that moment, I had an intuition that Michael was involved in this. I hadn't shared anything about Luke with him, my boss or not. But I had no proof. When I got home, Emily greeted me with a smile. It was hard to share the company troubles, but I couldn't keep it from her. Emily, there's been trouble at work, and it looks like I might be held responsible. I'll have to stay at home for a while. What happens after that? I couldn't tell what Emily's expression was as she looked down. I'm not sure yet, 
but I think I'll be losing my current position. Understood. I'll go back to my parents' house for a while. Let me know when things settle down. With that, Emily quickly packed her things and left the house without asking for further details. Later, I received a transfer order. This branch, located in the founder's hometown, has been downsized several times and faced closure, but it seems to exist solely because of its historical significance. Emily didn't come with me. When I informed her about the transfer over the phone, she simply said, I can't go to the countryside, the salary will be much less, right? And hung up. Later, my father-in-law came with the divorce papers already filled out. I thought I could trust you with Emily. It's a shame it has come to this, but it seems she's not willing to support you. It's better for both of you to go your separate ways. I'm sorry. I should have brought her here by force. It turned out that Emily needed a husband who worked for a somewhat reputable company. That must be why she never complained about my late returns home. I didn't care anymore and signed the divorce papers on the spot. Life at the branch was peaceful. The staff was kind, and though they must have known the reason for my demotion, they never mentioned it. But I hesitated to get deeply involved with them and kept my distance on my days off. Most of my assignments were peaceful, like store introductions and culture columns. They might be assigning these to help me get accustomed to the area. After always having hectic days since joining the company, living like this might not be so bad. And so, life at the branch went on. Amidst all this, I was summoned to the main office after a long time. I was required to attend a meeting about Thori Information Management. Of course, due to the incident involving me, absence was not an option. Early one morning, as I was walking to the station, I saw someone crouched down in the station square. Rushing over, I found an elderly woman with white hair, panting and in distress. Are you okay? I asked. I'll be fine. She replied weakly, trying to stand up, but she suddenly collapsed. I supported her, but she seemed to have lost consciousness. Laying her down, I called for an ambulance. Is this an accident or a medical emergency? The operator's voice helped me regain some composure. A medical emergency. An elderly woman has collapsed in front of the station. The ambulance is on its way. Please tell me about the patient's condition. Is she breathing? When I told the operator that her breathing had stopped, they said, please secure the airway and start CPR with chest compressions. Do you know how to do it? I have attended a training course before. Following the operator's instructions, I started compressing her chest. The elderly lady's chest sank under the pressure, which made me anxious. I remembered being taught to do so, but her consciousness and breathing did not return. I was afraid her frail body might break. Could she die right here in front of me? Just when I felt almost crushed by anxiety, the elderly lady suddenly gasped for air with a sharp gasp. Relief washed over me as I heard the distant sound of a siren. Tears mixed with sweat, creating a mess on my face. The patient is here. Please come with us in the ambulance, said the arriving paramedics. I got into the ambulance and explained the situation. I was passing by when I saw her crouching in pain, so I approached her, but after trying to stand up, she lost consciousness. So, she's not a relative of yours. Could you please explain the situation again at the hospital? Understood. Upon arriving at the hospital and speaking with the staff, I was released. However, I didn't feel like moving right away. I bought a hot coffee from a vending machine and sat down on the hard hospital sofa. I wondered if the elderly lady was all right. It was too late to make it to the meeting on time, so I needed to call and inform them. But I couldn't just not attend. From here, I could take a taxi to the nearest station. I didn't want to go, but I had no choice. Ah, uh, excuse me, thank you so much for helping her. A young woman, accompanied by hospital staff, approached me. You're the one who brought in our patient, right? 
she's recovered. This is her granddaughter, and she wants to thank you. Thank you for finding my grandmother. She was saved because you found her and acted quickly. I really appreciate it, she said. She appeared to have rushed over, wearing no makeup and glasses. She flicked her hair and thanked me. It's all right, I'm glad she's okay. Now, I must be going. Wait, were you heading to catch a train? Were you going into town? Let me drive you there, please. I tried to decline insisting she should stay with her grandmother, but she insisted and drove me to the nearest station. In the car, I excused myself to call the head office and inform them of my delay. Though it was unavoidable, I felt heavy-hearted. She asked for my cotic details, but I didn't want any further involvement, so I left using the train's timing as an excuse. The meeting went terribly. Although I had informed them that I was late due to a life-saving emergency, the nature of the meeting made it uncomfortable. I could feel the cold stares and the sarcasm in the speaker's words. I tried to investigate how the information had leaked after that incident but found no leads. I thought I had been very careful with my notebook and digital tools to prevent any leaks. Where could the leak have come from? I had no idea. I searched for spy tools or hidden cameras but found nothing. Hearing familiar instructions on information management, I returned home feeling drained. A week later, something unexpected happened. A call came to the newspaper office. It was from Eleanor, the elderly woman I had saved that day, asking me to visit her home to express her gratitude. I should be the one visiting you, but my granddaughter won't let me go out. You saved my life, and I really want to thank you. It's difficult to refuse a request from an elderly lady. Moreover, somehow, she knew both my workplace and my name. Refusing and risking her coming to the office would be awkward in front of my colleagues. I agreed to visit her on my next day off. The address she gave led me to a tasteful house. The well-maintained garden seemed to reflect the character of its inhabitants. As I rang the doorbell, I heard quick footsteps and the door opened. Welcome, Jason. We've been expecting you. Rachel, the granddaughter I met at the hospital, greeted me with a bright smile. Unlike that day, she had her long hair beautifully styled and was wearing a sky blue dress. Presumably wearing contact lenses today, she wasn't wearing her glasses. Please come in. My grandmother has been eagerly waiting for you in the living room. She assured me in, where the grandmother sat comfortably on a chair in the living room. Oh my, you're Jason. Thank you for coming. I don't know how to thank you enough. You're my lifesaver. I really appreciate it, she said. I was worried since she was not allowed to go out, but she seemed livelier than I expected. My granddaughter Rachel has prepared some food. Please have some. I helped a little, though I might have made more work for her. It's the thought that counts, right? Haha. <laughs> she seemed like a cheerful and lovely elderly lady. I was truly relieved that she didn't die right in front of me. While I was thinking this, Rachel brought out dish after dish. Mashed potatoes, braised chicken and vegetables, and pickled vegetables. The table looked like my family's during a festive occasion bringing back nostalgic feelings. Emily usually prepared Western-style dishes, and since our separation, I had mostly eaten out or had fast food, so it had been a while since I had homemade food. Do you like wine, Jason? We have some bottles we received as gifts, but we can't finish them by ourselves. It would be a waste to let them lose their flavor just sitting around. Would you like some? I was going to decline but the brand she offered piqued my interest. By the way, how did you know where I work and my name? I don't recall telling you. You must have told the hospital staff, right? I knew your name when we first met, and look at this. With a flourish, Rachel pulled out my business card from her pocket. It was in the car. Maybe you dropped it when you called. My family would have scolded me if I couldn't find out how to contact you. Lucky you dropped it. She laughed mischievously, just like her grandmother. 
It seemed she had prepared to show me the card. Eleanor was on her way to New York to meet her husband, who was there for work. Disliking the hustle and bustle, she usually lived here, but she would visit him on a whim. Once she makes up her mind, she leaves with just a note, so Rachel, who lives with her, is understandably worried. However, seeing her grandmother enjoy her outings, they now joke about it, saying, when I wake up in the morning, grandma has disappeared. But incidents like this one made it no laughing matter. My grandfather wanted to meet you too, but he had to return to the company urgently. He asked me to convey his deepest gratitude. They're still very much in love, you know. The food and wine were delicious, and I indulged. Eleanor and Rachel were great conversationalists, and before I knew it, I had shared everything. My demotion due to the leak, my swift abandonment by my wife whom I thought loved me, and the realization that she probably never loved me. Eleanor looked at me and said, Why don't we bring those two to justice together? Together, I wondered, what did she mean? Eleanor, as an Avenger, it was an odd thought. It seemed impossible. As I was puzzled, Rachel laughed mischievously. By the way, I forgot to introduce myself properly in my rush. I'm Rachel Thompson. Oh, but my grandmother must have mentioned my name when she invited you here, Jason. Does the name Thompson ring a bell in this area? Suddenly it clicked. Thompson, the founding family's name, and this was the founding location. So that meant, I am, in a manner of speaking, the chairman's wife. I'm the president's daughter. They looked at each other and laughed. But Eleanor quickly became serious again. Listening to your story, Jason, it seems wise to investigate possibilities other than your mistake. Michael, was it? There's no evidence, but he doesn't leave a good impression. And your ex-wife, her actions were too hasty upon hearing your story. It might be good to look into her as well. Her husband, the chairman, hated dishonesty and had run the newspaper with that principle. People who shared his beliefs had built up the company. Now, Eleanor's son and Rachel's father, President Thompson, was in charge. The idea of corruption in such a company was intolerable to them. Two months later, I was back at the head office. Michael, who had called the meeting, entered the conference room. Long time no see, Michael. You know why you've called me here, right? No, I don't. Maybe you're here for a promotion celebration. Anger rose inside me as Michael played dumb. It turned out he was the one who leaked the information to the university. And it was Emily who had informed him of my investigation. Michael and Emily were alumni of the same university and had dated for a while. However, Michael married another woman. Whether Emily working at the coffee shop in the newspaper building was a coincidence or her pursuit was unclear. But she dated me and we got married. Behind the scenes, she had rekindled her relationship with Michael. Emily informed you about the contents of my notebook, didn't she? When I confronted her with evidence of infidelity, she easily confessed everything. It's just a lie because she's upset that I dumped her. She's been a nuisance following me around since the old days. As Michael spat out these words, the conference room door swung open and President Thompson whooped in. You really don't give up, do you, Michael? Using the car phone for your scheming was a sloppy move. There's plenty of evidence left behind, and it seems there are other matters too. Smirking, President Thompson waved his cell phone, and Michael, dumbfounded, hung his head. It was an abrupt conclusion, but he seemed to have resigned himself to the situation. I wasn't told what was on the cell phone, but it appeared Michael had several other offenses. Following President Thompson, the HR director, David, escorted Michael out of the conference room. An inquiry was to follow, with disciplinary actions to be decided thereafter. Alone with President Thompson, he apologized, Jason, I'm sorry. We failed to investigate properly and hastily moved you from your department to the branch office. From the inquiries we've conducted, 
We heard consistently that you were an outstanding journalist and it's impossible for Jason to leak information if you're willing. We'd like you to return to the main office. Thanks for the offer, but I like my current job. If you're willing to consider my request, I'd like to continue working at the branch. Plus, encountering Eleanor Thompson and this incident happened because I was there. Not everything was bad. Saying this aloud, any lingering regrets about the main office vanished. I returned to the branch, continuing to cover heartwarming local news. Eleanor Thompson, still experiencing some paralysis, often had meals with us, joined by President Thompson, who seemed concerned for her. I started dating Rachel. President Thompson and Eleanor had me cornered. I had no intention of running, nor did it seem passable. Recently, Rachel asked me, what do you think about a reverse proposal? But I just laughed at official. The problem is Rachel is an only child, but I think a proposal should come from me, not in reverse.